Hey, gender queer atheists. How long have we been a group now? We have a hundred members. I'm going to say that this is Koki Pirate. Did a video on biphobia, the cotton ceiling, and gold stars. <laughs> gold stars. Um, link in the underwear. <laughs> and I lit a cigarette while I was watching it, and all of a sudden, and if you're not sexually attracted to trans women because you think they're not women, pause, then fuck you. <laughs> I was in the middle of lighting a cigarette. Then there's the pause as I am inhaling. And then the fuck you. And this had been such an articulate video up until that point. <laughs> About gold star lesbians um, in the 1970s, I self-described as a radical lesbian feminist. So... I'm dismayed to say that in all that period of time, things have not seemed to have improved much. <laughs> we had really good reasons for being separatists. Really good. Please remember that back then, women couldn't have credit uh, without a man such as a husband, father. Uh, couldn't have inheritance. Uh, were more likely to lose custody of their children because they couldn't get good incomes. Uh, the prefix Ms. could get you fired. It got me a fail on a test once. Please remember these are very different times. The fact that we're still doing, or we, listen to me, the fact that the conversation is still the same in 2011, what is that, 40 years later? Oh, girls, please. All right, gold star lesbian. I could never be a gold star lesbian because I'm an incest survivor. I didn't have the privilege to be a gold star lesbian. Let's look at the word lesbian, shall we? First of all, I need to preface this by saying I have, I'm indebted for the rest of my life to the care, love, and acceptance of the radical lesbian feminist community of Los Angeles of the 1970s. I was a teenage runaway, escaping severe child abuse. I didn't know it at the time, but I had brain injuries, mutilated genitals. I was a mess. And those women took me in, unemployable, crazy as a shithouse rat. And they taught me how to change tires and balance checkbooks and take personal responsibility for myself. And I love them for that. It doesn't mean they didn't cause some damage. We are all damaged. We damage each other, all of us human beings. Gold star lesbians. I remember back then that uh, the poetry of Sappho was very popular because uh, we were looking for role models and cat hair. I need to remind people something about Sappho. Sappho was Greek. She uh, lived on the island of Lesbos, hence the word lesbian. It used to be kind of a code word if you said lesbian People didn't know what the hell you were talking about. I'm not kidding. Like gay. People didn't know what you were talking about. It was a code word. And then we transitioned to something like family. I don't know what we're using now. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Sappho wrote basically love poetry. She wrote two types of love poetry. One was to female lovers. But please remember that a lot of her poems were directed to her daughter. I don't know a whole lot about an antique Greek culture, classical Greek culture, but I don't think they had turkey basters. And I'll bet Sappho uh, acquired her daughter the old-fashioned way by rubbing bellies with a male. So much for gold star lesbians. Oh, about the cotton ceiling. There's something more pernicious and more deeply disturbing to me than whether or not gays accept trans people, and I'm not going to exclude trans men from this conversation, whether gays and lesbians and even bisexuals and so-called pansexuals, <clears throat> it's not about accepting them as sexual partners by critiquing the queer community, the larger queer community for the marginalization of trans people, and I would add gender queer people, uh, around uh, sexual attraction, but something more pernicious is going on than that, and that psychological is psychological isolation. 
See, queer people have been sexualized. Remember that they used to call us homosexuals and sometimes still do? Homosexuals. Not homoerotic, not homoamorous. Sexual. It's one reason why we're perceived as perverts. Too much emphasis placed on sexual. So we have internalized this to some extent, and we live in a hypersexual culture where everything is marketed based on the commodification of other human beings. You're not pretty enough. You're not smart enough. Your breath doesn't smell good enough. Your feet aren't encased in the right shoes just to sell products. Teach us to be unsatisfied with our bodies and our sexualities so that they can addict us to, to buying more and more and more products because the products don't make us feel better, so we go out and buy more. So what's pernicious about this is that I don't think the queer community is acknowledging how much we have turned each other into objects and commodities. And I'm not saying it's our fault we've internalized this from a larger culture. But we need to look at it. It's our fault if we're in denial and don't look at it. Then we're not taking responsibility for it. And I remember from the lesbian community, and I really believe this is true from a lot of the gay male community too, is that the intimacy of friendship, our abilities to work together on social projects, on barbecuing, on starting businesses, on repairing cars, on organizing protests had to do with the fact that we had a real emotional intimacy with each other because there's all these jokes about the lesbian community in particular. I'll speak to the lesbian community because I'm most familiar with it. The lesbian community was so incestuous. We all had slept with somebody that we had slept with somebody. We all knew each other in the biblical sense. Or for like, it wasn't even six degrees of separation. Say. And that builds a, a, a family feeling, a psychological, emotional, psychosexual, emotional family feeling. And I think that what trans people are experiencing, particularly trans women, but I don't know, I'll have to talk to more trans men to find out if this is true, is that feeling of that there's something missing and that they're not quite family. It's more like being a guest at the table. And I know this in my experience as a gender queer is that I don't quite fit the expected roles. I'm not butch. I'm not femme. And they don't know where to put you. Again, be I think because of expectations from the larger culture that we're supposed to divide into a gender binary. Somebody's got to be the man. Somebody's got to lead. So I think what we need to look at is the social dynamics in the entire queer community, not just among gays, lesbians, bisexuals, not just um, among the amorous sexual community, but among all queers. What are the messages that we're carrying around with us that don't have anything to do with who we are? We're already questioning that. We're questioning the roles of male and female, presentations of male and female. And it scares the hell out of more traditional binary cisgendered uh, lesbians and gays and even bisexuals and pansexuals. It scares the hell out of them because we're pulling the rug out from under everything. But we have a real, we're in a real fortunate position to be able to deconstruct a lot of the internalized messages that we've seen, we've absorbed from the larger culture and really look at them and break them down and not enhance not only our own growth, but the growth of the larger culture. Imagine a bunch of little kids in elementary school that didn't have to worry about all this crap we've had to deal with. And if I don't see some of those a large portion of those bubblegum pink toys for girls disappear off the store shelves pretty soon. If a Toys R Us burns down, don't blame me. Are there still Toys R Uses? I don't know. I don't consumer shop, so I don't know. We have a lot of internalized damage. We have a lot of issues. We've heard a lot of messages that teach us to 
hate ourselves and we tend not to be very patient with each other and the way I look Especially at it operating this uh, genderqueer atheist Facebook page as an administrator the way I look at it is this is a sanctuary for people who have endured great damage simply because they live in a society that condemns anything outside the status quo. And there are things people say and do in gender for atheists that I would like to be able to vent my own personal irritation, resentment at some of the things that are said and done, but I don't because all of us are more important than just my personal butt hurt, which is another phrase, butt hurt. Think about that. That comes from prison. That comes from anal rape, asserting dominance, asserting oneself as the alpha male. Think about that. How I feel personally is not as important as creating space for everyone, as long as I take care of my own feelings, and I do. But we come from places of real damage, and we need to support each other around that. We need to cut each other a little bit of slack. I'm not saying let things slide and get all codependent and let people be all sick and ticky and not take responsibility for their personal lives. We need to encourage each other to do that. But we need to allow each other space to grow to heal. I don't know what triggers you. You don't know what triggers me. There's unfolding that needs to occur. We're at the beginning stages of something monumental that can be really transformational to the whole species. We're going beyond gender. We're starting to see a movement toward post-gender. Gender is not so important anymore. I argue to pretty much anybody except the real fundamentalist jackasses who want to hang on to the old school way of doing things that no longer work and aren't applicable in the 21st century. But the species is evolving into something potentially quite wonderful. And we're on the cutting edge of that. And we've seen the most god-awful abuses. We need to be a little kind to each other. We need to recognize that we're damaged. We need to try to be patient with other people's own baggage. And help each other grow rather than letting this unravel because of infighting. Don't do that. My last and final thought is, uh, you know how um, when people, uh, to this day, and it's 40, 50 years, 60 years later, people in little small towns in middle America, I'm going to move to San Francisco so I can come out. In fact, there are some snobs in San Francisco who say, well, if you're living in a small town and, and you can't come out, you did it to yourself. Oh, really? Not all of us can afford to move to San Francisco, and you wouldn't like it if we did. Uh, but I had this really sad you know, thought. Uh, apparently, uh, several of us in genderqueer atheists are living in and around St. Louis, Missouri. Wouldn't it be fun if St. Louis, Missouri became the Mecca for genderqueer people? Especially genderqueer atheist people. We are middle America. We are working class. Uh, genderqueer people have lower incomes. We have less access to resources. We can't afford to move to San Francisco. We're not particularly... We, we'd have to fight the pink triangle ceiling if we got out there because all the cliques and the camps and the 
what pocket you wear your handkerchief in and what color it is. And mm -hmm. Would it be funny if we all just started our headquarters in St. Louis, Missouri, working class, middle America, Missouri? It took over St. Louis. <laughs> Never mind. All right, I'm starting to babble, so I'm going to um, edit this and put it up. So thank you, Gender Queer Atheist, for being a supportive and very precocious, fun, happy, interesting, intelligent, and heartfelt community. Thank you very much. And happy 100th people person. <laughs>